Hello and welcome to this NET English Poetry Talk Through for the AQA Power and Conflict Anthology. And today I'm going to be walking you through the context and the content for My Last Duchess. Now let's start with a quick reading of the poem. So, My Last Duchess. That's My Last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. For our panel's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said pra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turn, since none's put, put, none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there, so not the first I you to turn and ask thus. So it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere, so it was all one. My favourite her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with around the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. I mean, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, and say, just this or that in you disgusts me, here you miss, or there exceed the mark, and then she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, for sooth and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise, we'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Now, Robert Browning, who lived from 1812 to 1889, was a Victorian poet and playwright. Browning's key creative period overlapped with the final sparks of Romanticism, but Browning, despite being heavily influenced by Shelley early in his literary career, was quite clear in his rejection of what he saw as the, the poetic and the intellectual self-indulgence of Romanticism as a movement. Now, Browning, although writing in a number of genres, including plays and pamphlets, was best known for his poetry, and in particular for a series of dramatic monologues. Now, these were extended poems, often with historical settings. He wrote them in distinctive voices that served to interrogate and to criticise key issues in society, while also evidencing uh, his own dark humour. Now, Browning took many influences from his parents and from his upbringing. Browning's father was a clerk, but also an abolitionist and a literary collector. His mother was a talented musician and a religious nonconformist. Now, from his parents, in addition, in addition to a varied education and a lively sense of intellectual curiosity, Browning also seems to have inherited a keen sense of, of social conscience, along with a worldview that looked beyond British society for influence and also for creative sustenance, with Browning spending a lot of his adult life living in Italy. Now, Robert Browning would eventually marry Elizabeth Barrett, who was an older and arguably a more successful poet at the time. And the popular, if, if perhaps rather patronising, view is that the dashing Robert rescued Elizabeth from the cruelty and emotional abuse of her tyrannical father. Manas Duchess was, however, published before the two had even met, although some modern readers do attempt, with limited success, to make connections between those things. <laughs> 
Well, as Duchess was first published in 1842, but it focuses on uh, a real historical relationship between the Duke of Ferrara, who was called Alfonso uh, d'Este, who lived from 1533 to 1598, and his first wife, Lucretia di Cosimo de' Medici, who lived from 1545 to 1561. Now, we know that because of this reference to Ferrara at the beginning of the poem. Now, the relationship between these two people was problematic from the very beginning. The Esther family were powerful, they were established and respected with, with a long history. Lucretia's family, the Medici, were wealthy and increasingly powerful, but they were looked down on as social upstarts, nouveau riche. Lucretia's intelligence, her independence and her education also seemed to have been problematic for her husband. Now the Duchess died just three years after their wedding, and she had been abandoned by her husband for the final two of those years. There were rumours, probably untrue, that the Duke of Ferrara had had his wife poisoned, although it's all but impossible for us to actually know. The poem is written as a dramatic monologue, which is an extended poetic speech written from the perspective of and in the voice of the Duke. Now, at the beginning of the poem, the Duke directs the attention of his audience, who is the servant of the Count your master, we find out later, but also in reality, as the audience, it, it, it's us, the readers. So the Duke's directing our attention to the painting of My Last Duchess that hangs on the wall. There's an immediate sense of ownership through both the pronoun choice, my, and also the phrasing. It's a painting, but it's presented as being My Last Duchess, as if the object is the reality, rather than simply a representation of a person. We're also immediately given hints, narrative hooks, as to the narrative behind the situation. She looks as if she were alive, meaning, of course, that she is dead. How? We don't know. But also pointing to an underlying theme within the poem of appearance and reality. Now, Browning's dramatic monologues are famous for narrators who reveal more to their audience than the speaker appears to intend, and it's true here. The Duke is clearly someone focused on possessions, on ownership, and on the objectification of people. And the display of those objects is a display of his power and control. Now, there's a name drop for our Pandolf's hands work busily a day near the beginning, as there is also at the end of the poem with Klaus of Innsbruck, with the Duke admitting that the inclusion of the name in his comment is entirely deliberate. I said for our Pandolf by design. What he's doing, it seems, is showing off regarding the quality of the work and also the control he has over the artist. It's also clear that this is something the Duke has done on a number of occasions. Never read Strangers Like You That Pictured Countenance. The artists, by the way, are probably fictional. What's also revealing is the contrast between the static nature of the object, the painting, and the depth and passion of the earnest glance that is depicted in the picture. The apparent emotional reality it seems to portray. This translates also into the juxtaposition of the Duke and the Duchess. He is object-focused, emotionally repressed and controlling. Ask me if they durst, he later comments. She is the exact opposite, it seems. Now that control is also clear in the Duke's assertion that none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. The display of the painting is the surface meaning. But it's also clear that the Duke now has absolute control over the presentation and also the representation of his dead wife in a way that he couldn't when she was alive. There's also a suggestion of the possessive control of the showing of her body, as if the curtain is, in a sense, almost an intimate revealing of her. It's relevant in terms of the later references to Fra Pandolf's comments about the mantle that laps over my lady's wrist or the half flush that dies along her throat. There's a strong undercurrent of jealousy and the suspicion of flirtation or infidelity or the desire for infidelity in the Duke's comments. And this is perhaps a key reason for his demonstration of his absolute power over and his control of access to her in the form of the painting. The Duke's insecurity is clear in the complaint admission that it was not her presence, sorry, not her husband's presence only, 
that called a spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. The Duchess was, it seems, or at least so it seemed to the Duke, flattered by Fra Pandolf's comments on the mantle overlapping her wrist, with hints of flattery and flirtatious intimacy, perhaps, for a more staid Victorian audience. The half-flush that dies along her throat suggests that she's blushing, but it also foreshadows the final hinted revelation of her death, and perhaps even the, the manner in which it occurred. As a very minor point, Fra, brother, is a title given to an Italian monk or a friar, which makes the undercurrent of the Duke's jealousy uh, and his insecurity even more jarring. It's not just an artist, but a celibate servant of God. From the Duke's perspective, the Duchess was not calculating and deceptive, but naive, foolish, easily led and shallow. She believed such stuff was courtesy and couldn't see a problem with it calling up that spot of joy. In the Duke's phrasing, she had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. And we can see also the sense of hesitancy in how he describes it. There's non-fluency in terms of interjections such as, how shall I say, I know not how, and so on, which evidences the inarticulacy that he himself later addresses. The Duchess, the Duke comments, liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere, implying that he thinks she had what we would call a wandering eye. And again, notice the focus on view and on perception. There's an idea in modern literary criticism of the male gaze, the way in which the world views women from an objectifying male perspective, in which the male perspective is seen as normal, and in which women are simply things to be physically viewed and admired, rather than people in their own right. It's not a literary term, or even an idea that Browning would have known or used. It wasn't introduced until I think the 20th century, but the poem is absolutely a critical representation of that idea, and Browning is encouraging us to realise, to interrogate, and to reject it. The Duke, remember, is object-focused. He gave the Duchess my favour, a brooch or another piece of jewellery, to wear at her breast, a physical location with connotations of emotions and also the self. The Duchess, however, finds equal pleasure in viewing the dropping of the daylight, perhaps another hint towards her eventual demise. Uh, she also finds it in the bough of cherries, with potentially intimate connotations. She finds it in the white mule that she rides. Notice that the Duke is linked to things that are fixed, that are unchanging, that are inorganic. The Duchess is linked to things that change, that grow, that live. The Duke's complaint is that the Duchess seems to find happiness in things that do not depend on or do not originate from him. And the reference to the blush links us back to that spot of joy and the faint half flush. Now, instead of seeing a strict social hierarchy within which she must function and therefore um, finding greatest value in his gift of a 900 years old name, she, the Duchess, values anybody's gift. Now, this does link back to the historical figures and perhaps also to wider social tensions. The contrast between the new money duchess, who finds joy and pleasure in everything, and the old money duke, obsessed with reputation, with perception, with ownership. From the duke's perspective, he and his, his gifts should matter more because it's him. It's the same later in the poem, where he complains about her smiles, who passed without much the same smile. The Duke's inarticulacy, uh, contrasted with the Duchess's apparent verbal confidence, is most clearly represented in the next few lines here. The Duchess would give the approving speech and thanked men, notice thanked men, while the Duke seems unable to fluently express his thoughts and his feelings. He says good, but thanked somehow or I know not how. He seems unable to express himself when the topic links to any admission of what he would see as weakness on his part, even allowing for his admission in terms of the skill in speech that he has not. However, this also extends to a refusal to, he believes, weaken himself through communicating emotions. Hood stoop to blame this sort of trifling, the Duke asks. And the verb stoop is important here. To admit emotions or insecurities even to admit what disgusts him or where you miss or there exceed the mark is beneath him, he thinks, involves lowering himself. It's a loose face and status in the eyes of others. 
Notice unsurprisingly that the perspective is entirely his own. The focus is on what disgusts me and where she would miss or exceed the mark. It's entirely one-way traffic rather than any kind of negotiation or connection. And it's based on a scale of measurement and reference frame that is entirely self-centered. It's also worth making the obvious point that paintings don't talk. What the Duke has managed in the poem is to silence his wife, is to own the narrative and to make his the only voice that's heard. The Duchess has, in the Duke's mind, become such an one, an object or an example rather than an individual, but also someone who is independent enough to be potentially unwilling to be lessened. Now the verb lessened clearly carries connotations of being taught, schooled, as if she's a child needing to learn how to function. Now the historical figures did have an around 11 year age gap, but this is also potentially an example of the patronising assumption of male superiority and dominance. However, it also carries the sense of being lessened with an E, to be made less. And it's the power dynamic that the Duke seems to find most problematic, the fear that she might set her wits to his. The Duke is threatened by his wife's intelligence and independence, but it's unclear whether he's actually bothered to speak to her about any of this. The implication, in fact, is that he hasn't. The Duke, he makes clear, chooses never to stoop. In terms of what happened next, it, it isn't entirely clear. The behaviour, the Duke comments, grew. And think back to that contrast between the artificial sterility of the Duke's worldview and the contrast with the, the natural and the organic worldview of the Duchess. The Duke gave commands, and notice that this is a demonstration again of his power and control rather than something he does himself. And then all smiles stopped together. It's unclear whether Browning intends the reader to understand that the Duke has had his wife killed, or whether he simply acted to extract happiness with smiles representing joy in this line of discussion from her life in some other way, such as by having her confined to a convent and thus away from men and outside influences. The first inter interpretation, the one where he's had her killed, is the one that seems more in keeping with the poem and tends to be more accepted. Part of the ambiguity, of course, comes from the use of euphemism. The Duke doesn't explicitly say what happened in the same way that he never explicitly told the Duchess of his concerns. The impact of the line is also partially thanks to the way it's constructed. The abrupt and fragmented phrasing, the simple declarative statements, the sense of cause and effect, the triplet, the break onto the second line for the heavily loaded comment about the smiles, the juxtaposition of grew and stopped with the inbuilt implied contrast between the Duke and the Duchess, the distilling of the Duke's inarticulacy and jealousy of his social and patriarchal arrogance. It, it is, it's a really useful quotation and it's all the more shocking for the simplicity of its phrasing. We're given a repetition of the reference to the Duchess looking as if alive that gives the poem a sense of circularity. And it also colours and changes our earlier interpretation with an abrupt shift immediately afterwards from the death of his previous wife to the apparent arrangement of his next marriage. It shows the Duke's callous self-centredness, again, in that it's, it's jarring for an audience in a way that it appears not to be for the Duke, particularly when the marriage is linked immediately to ownership and possessions. The Count is known for his munificence, his generosity. The Duke is thinking about the dowry, the payment that the Count will make to his daughter's future husband. And the daughter is defined immediately by her physical attractiveness, fair, and as the Duke's object literally meaning his aim, the thing he's trying to achieve, but also strongly connoting what he wants from a wife, something to own. This is reinforced by the final image of the poem, the reference to the bronze statue of Neptune taming a seahorse. The Duke gives another name drop, Klaus of Innsbruck, and emphasises the value and the exclusivity of the sculpture, a rarity cast in bronze for me. But the subject of the statue may also be worth noting. A classical god, Neptune, taming and therefore asserting and establishing lasting control over a natural creature 
and it's presumably a metaphor for how the Duke sees the relationship that he will have with his new wife, turning her metaphorically, and ominously perhaps literally, into another object that he can own. In terms, again, then, of building comparisons within the AQA anthology, the focus on an abusively authoritarian figure, especially a male one, links neatly with Ozymandias. And this also provides an easy link to the focus on the creation and the ownership of art objects. That that might also connect with the poems such as War Photographer or Tissue or even The Emigre. In terms of the tension between differing views, there's a link to be made with checking out my history, with kamikaze, maybe even with poppies, and there's an interesting angle based on the gender dynamic with, with, with those. Or perhaps even with something like the prelude. Thank you very much for listening, as ever. And don't forget that the range of videos um, on Parent Conflict can also be found, along with all the other videos and all the other English topics, on the Net English YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash NET English 1.